I've built four hydrofoiling watercraft in the past that use electronic height control. This means there's a microcontroller on board that automatically adjusts either the throttle or control surfaces to try and constantly maintain the correct height above the water. But the microcontroller itself can't measure the height. For that job we need external sensors. On all four of these hydrofoils, I've used sonar sensors. Sonar works by emitting an ultrasonic chirp and measuring how long it takes before that chirp echoes off the water's surface and returns back to the sensor. This delay is then converted into a distance measurement by the microcontroller. It's the same thing that bats use to fly in the dark, except without the microcontroller. Sonar has worked pretty well for my hydrofoil experiments, and it's also what a lot of the full-scale hydrofoiling boats use for their height control, but I've always wondered if there's a better way to do it. If only we could somehow make the hydrofoil mast just feel the water. In this video, that's exactly what we're going to do. I first got this idea when I came across these simple little resistive liquid level sensors. They work by measuring the amount of electrical current that can flow between traces on a printed circuit board. Water is conductive, so the amount of current that can flow between the traces changes with water level. It then uses a transistor and some other components to convert that current into an analog voltage that a microcontroller can read. The best part is, the whole thing can be made on a printed circuit board. The board part of the printed circuit board is just fiberglass. And fiberglass is exactly what boats are made of. So what if we just make the whole mast for a remote control hydrofoil boat out of one big PCB and put the liquid level sensor electronics on there so it can measure water level? Eureka! The problem is, I don't know how to design PCBs, so I hired a random freelancer guy to basically just copy this random liquid level sensor schematic that I found onto this board outline that I designed. Then I ordered the PCB assemblies from PCBWay, and a couple weeks later they showed up. I also ordered this wing-shaped PCB, which is basically just a blank PCB with solder pads around the slot in the middle. This allows us to solder it onto the bottom of the mast PCB. It's the actual hydrofoil wing that will be creating lift. Don't mind the fact that it doesn't actually have an airfoil or hydrofoil profile. We'll deal with that later. Once the board showed up, one issue I noticed is that the guy failed to make the electrodes alternating positive, negative, positive, negative, and so on. He just put all the positive ones on the front and all the negative ones on the back. Despite this, upon connecting 5 volts and ground, I discovered that it actually worked. I could measure a voltage signal between roughly 0 and 3 volts that would change with the water level, so that was exciting. Upon hooking it up to an Arduino, we can get a better visualization of the voltage signal. Wow, that's awesome. It seems like the readings are definitely fast enough to be able to stabilize a real hydrofoil boat. Or not a real hydrofoil boat, but a real toy hydrofoil boat. Look how fast it is. Pew, 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 And speed is what we need for high bandwidth altitude control. Despite my excitement, I never actually ended up building a boat with these masts, which is kind of a bummer. But the story doesn't end here. Around this time, I put a callout for electrical engineering help at the end of one of my videos. The callout was for an entirely different project, but a lot of really talented people reached out. This also happens to be how I found Steve that designed the color shadow lamp circuitry. Shout out to Steve. It also happens to be how I met Tomasz. Hi everyone. Who is an electrical engineer from Hungary. I pitched the PCB hydrofoil project and showed him the initial prototype, and he replied with some concern about electrochemical corrosion. He then ordered a resistive liquid level sensor to test and found that it did indeed start to corrode when left powered on for long periods of time. Despite this, we proceeded down the resistive sensor path. Tomasz built this 3D printed version that used a higher resolution ADC, and that performed decently well, so then he started a new and improved version of the PCB design. It took a few iterations, but we eventually got to our final shape. And after a healthy dose of scope creep, we decided to put an ESP32C3 microcontroller on every unit. This will allow the hydrofoils to talk to each other, and it will also allow them to be configured from any Wi-Fi enabled device, similar to the color shadow lamp. It also uses the same ESP32C3 processor. So once the board design was finished, we ordered more prototypes from PCBWay, and eventually they came, and Tomash got to work testing them. And the results were not so good. The water level measurement was drifting over time, as it was on my previous samples, probably due to electrolytic corrosion. This likely wouldn't be an issue in the short term, and the device would be capable of stabilizing a hydrofoil boat, but in the long term you would probably end up needing to constantly calibrate the water level endpoints, and eventually the electrodes would get eaten away by hydrolysis. When you run electrical current through bare metal underwater, it will corrode the metal away, and the H2O will get broken down into just H and O. That's what these little bubbles are. This sample had been powered on in slightly salty water for 24 hours. You can see how the once shiny metal turned gray in some areas, as it was corroded away. We had hoped that reducing the electrical current would eliminate the electrochemical corrosion, so we decided to proceed with our new design. But just a few months before, I had the resistive liquid level sensors on my autonomous boat get completely destroyed due to corrosion. So maybe I should have been a little more suspicious. 
but ultimately we were unhappy with the reliability of the liquid level measurement, and this issue led us to revisit one of the very first ideas we ever discussed. Back when I first mentioned the PCB hydrofoil project to Tomash, he threw together this little prototype using a different type of liquid level sensor that he had laying around. This one used capacitance instead of resistance. A capacitor works by storing electrical energy in an electric field between two conductive plates. The two plates are separated by an insulating material called a dielectric. When a voltage is applied to the plates, an electric charge builds up around them, and this electrostatic charge stays there even if you disconnect the voltage. So a capacitor is, in a sense, kind of like a little battery. The key bit of info for our application is that the type of material you use as the dielectric changes how much charge the capacitor can store. If the dielectric is just air, the capacitance decreases. If the dielectric is water, the capacitance increases. We can use this to our advantage if we're constantly charging and discharging the capacitor. If the dielectric is air, it will charge up really fast because it doesn't have that much capacitance. If the dielectric is water, it will take longer to charge up because it has more capacitance. And if the dielectric is only half water, it will take roughly half as long to charge. So all we need to do is use our microcontroller to measure how long it takes the capacitor to charge up, and that will tell us where the water level is. This concept should still work even if the plates or traces are mounted on a PCB, since there will still be a little bit of water in this gap. The big benefit to this capacitive liquid level sensor design is that the electrodes, or the plates, can be completely insulated from the water, and therefore there will never be any electrolytic corrosion. Tomash threw together some larger capacitive probes out of copper strips, and at first the readings were pretty sluggish. This is because they were relying on the gap in between the two copper traces to measure the capacitance, and water would be slow to leave this gap due to its surface tension. There was also just not a lot of capacitance in this probe design. The next big breakthrough was realizing that the negative pole of the probe should be in contact with the water. In this case, the capacitance increases immensely, and the positive plate remains isolated, so it won't corrode. Also, it turns out capacitors don't need the liquid to be in between the plates, they only need the liquid to be near the electric field that forms around the plates. This means that we can have the positive plate on one side and the negative plate on the other side of the PCB. And even though the fiberglass PCB is the only dielectric that's really separating the plates, the surrounding water still interacts with the electric field enough to strongly affect the capacitance. This is called fringe field capacitance, and it's really what allows capacitors to work for liquid level measurement applications. Luckily, Tomash was able to rework the existing PCBs to measure capacitance instead of resistance, and the results seemed promising. It just required some capped-on tape over the positive plate and some additional electrical components to allow the microcontroller to measure the charge time. Since the performance seemed promising, he updated the board design and we ordered more PCBs. We were getting pretty close to the final hardware design at this point, but still not quite there. I have a couple of these longer term collaborative type projects going on in the background and they require a lot of PCBA prototyping. Luckily, PCBA has been super supportive of these projects and I'm really happy to have them as a sponsor of this video. Not only do they do PCB prototyping, but they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, injection molding, and more. Check out what they can make for your projects at the PCBA link in the description. At this point, I could start testing these things in the lake, so I started building a simple test boat. It's gonna be a trifoiler, so we'll need the one rear foil to be able to steer. To accomplish that, I designed some pivoting foil mounts in Onshape. There are going to be a lot of iterations after this one, so if you want access to this model or any of the subsequent ones, they're all available at the Onshape link in the description. There will also be more optimized hydrofoil watercraft versions that you can print at home. But anyhow, I 3D printed all of the pivot mount parts and just hot glued those onto the flat foam hull. I knew this hull would have a ton of water surface tension sucking it down, and it wouldn't be very easy to get it up off the water and onto foil. So to solve this, I'm putting the motor in the front and angling it down so that it blows air under the hull. This will kind of help it levitate up off the water like a hovercraft. And it's also kind of like par thrust on a ground effect vehicle. Here's everything assembled. To protect the electronic components from water on the hydrofoil mast PCB, I covered them in hot glue. So right now I just have the servos directly connected to the RC receiver, just to kind of get a proof of concept to see if this platform will even work. While it floats, that's a good start. It almost seems like it's able to get up. So unfortunately, it did not have enough power, probably because I had it running on a 2S battery and the prop was too small. The whole hovercraft concept seems to kind of work though. Look at how terrible and jittery the servo response was at this point. Even if it did have enough power, I don't think the hydrofoil PCBs would have been able to actively control the altitude. Once back at the shop, I replaced the propeller with a bigger one, and despite the jittery servo behavior, I headed back to the lake. Look at that, I just found two turtles. There's one right there and one right here. Boop. 
There he is. The new propeller alone didn't increase the thrust enough to get it up on foil, so then I switched over to a 3S battery and now I had plenty of thrust. It's up, it's up, it's up, oh it's good, ah oh, it's bad. And at this point it became clear that the boat really did not want to stay up on foil, almost definitely due to the really slow and jittery servo response. Uh-oh, something burnt out. Luckily I've got two hydrofoils here today so I can use one to save the other, but <laughs> one is riding on its side. Maybe it's not the best rescue boat. Come on buddy, push it back. There you go. Oh, it's going the wrong way. I can't control it. <laughs> wow, both of these things are just useless. <laughs> That's it. Nicely done. At this point I had convinced Tomash that there was an issue, but we weren't sure if it was with the software or water clinging to the masts for too long. A lot of ideas were thrown around, like wax on the solder mask, capped on tape, or even diagonal traces to encourage water to fall off. Eventually he was able to reproduce the issue on his end, and so then he started trying to find the root cause. In order to get some nice repeatable input movements, he hooked up the mast to a repurposed 3D printer. This allowed the water level to be raised and lowered at a consistent rate so he could see if the problem was with the measurement, the PID controller, or the servo output. The test rig worked great, and Tomash was able to collect some nice clean data. Simultaneously, I was trying to do some testing of my own. Okay, slow down. Eventually, he was able to solve the bug, and the servo output now looked way better. I updated the firmware on my masts, and then it was back to the lake. You can see how the servo response is much faster than it was before. So today we got some new technology to try out, so we should have much faster response time on the servos that control the hydrofoil pitch. Oh yeah, that definitely helps. Wow, it's working really well. So the problem Tomash had found was that the PID library was only updating 10 times per second by default, even though the software was calling it to update at 100 times per second. Also, I should add that this was with completely square edges on the masts and hydrofoils. I had not started grinding them down yet. From a hydrodynamic perspective, it's really pretty amazing that this worked at all. Sweet hydrofoil. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> that was the launch boat over there. It seems pretty immune to center of gravity shift. There's also the whole PID controller thing. At this point, I hadn't really attempted any PID tuning at all. I just had the P term set to around one, and that seemed to work decently well. <sighs> Seaweed is our enemy. Lakeweed, whatever. Look at these kids just hanging. <laughs> That's pretty funny. And at this point, the web server user interface was working pretty well. You can connect to one master unit with any Wi-Fi enabled device and change its settings. And it also has the ability to forward settings to all the other slave devices over the ESP Now protocol. Pretty fancy. This makes changing PID values and setting the servo endpoints really easy. Finally, it's time to try sharpening the hydrofoil edges so that they're not just a bunch of 90 degree corners. I sharpened the mast edges too, and also waxed the solder mask to hopefully get water to fall off more quickly. Then it was back to the lake. Seems to be nice and hydrophobic. That's good. Those things in the water are the big wings from my paddleboard hydrofoil. So yeah, this was over a year and a half ago from now, and we first started the project about a year before that, so it's been a long road to get to this point. Anyhow, the sharpened masts and wax did seem to help quite a bit. It's also worth noting that I did not sharpen the rear foil, probably should have in hindsight. But the boat was really easy to drive, easy enough as to where I could hold the RC controller and steer with one hand, and hold the camera with the other hand. You don't need to do any manual attitude control. The PCB hydrofoils take care of all that for you. With too much throttle, it would start to hydroplane rather than hydrofoil. This suggests I need to do some PID tuning. At this point, there were still quite a few software issues that we were working through, but obviously nothing too serious since the boat was foiling just fine. The bug that was annoying me the most was that the servo mid position seemed to change when you would adjust the P term. This one took a lot of back and forth, but eventually Tomash was able to fix it. He also got RC control working so that a servo signal could be used to control the set point of the PID controller. Around this time I also tried an underwater motor to provide the majority of the thrust, but it was a hydrodynamic abomination, so it should be no surprise that it did not really work well. So then I took it off and headed back to the lake the next day to test what I thought would be the final version 1.0 firmware that this thing would ship with. Oh did I forget to mention, you'll be able to buy these things. At this point I still hadn't even really done any proper PID tuning. All I did was increase the P-term until it started porpoising, and then back it off a bit. So Tomas and I have finally worked out all the bugs, and now it's working really well. 
I'm super impressed with how stable this thing is. Since everything seemed good, I figured we better start working on a production programming and test fixture so that the factory can more easily program and test a large quantity of these things. Tomas thought the fixture should automatically dunk the PCB after programming it to verify the water level measurement worked, but I figured it would be just as fast if the worker did it manually, so this is what I came up with. It's just a little fixture with a tag connect sticking out for programming, and some pogo pins to read and write a servo signal. The whole thing just sits on the rim of a water glass. Tomash made this program that has the Espressive flash download tool built in for firmware programming, and then it checks the water level reading and the servo inputs and outputs, and gives the worker a pass or a fail. Here's a weird experiment. I put a PCB mast on this old 3D printed foil test platform. You can see how it's controlling the elevator angle. It ended up not really working at all. I think this was mainly because the elevator response was pretty sluggish since it goes super slow and the roll axis was really hard to manually stabilize by hand. I was gonna make this whole PCB hydrofoil project one video, but it's already pretty long and there's still a lot more to cover. Here's a little teaser of what's to come in the next video. These hydrofoil kits are already available for sale on rctestflight.com, but it might be a good idea to wait until the next video before buying one, just so you know what you're getting yourself into. So that's all for this video. One quick update on the color shadow lamp project. I shipped one to Tomasz in Hungary and he pointed it at this really cool expanding ball. Looks pretty neat. They've been selling quickly, but there are still plenty left in stock for you. They would make great gifts for the holiday season, so if you want to check it out, there's a link in the description. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.